I'm Mark Rutland, I work at ARM, and I'm going to be talking about F-Trace. And as this is an F-Trace talk, and is apparently tradition, I've got a camera, and I'm going to try and take a selfie with everyone. <laughs> so. <laughs> Christ. <laughs> Smile. <laughs> right. Um, so as I mentioned, I work at ARM. Digital. <laughs> I left my medium format at home. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I work at ARM. I do a lot of ARM kernel related things, normally in areas where we have to like do play around with assembly or play around with like CPU architecture and interact with the core code. And that means I have to deal with lots of horrible problems like our entry assembly, atomics, and interactions with various subsystems like perf, and most recently, ftrace. Um, and in the process of working on that over the last few years, uh, there's been a lot of occasions where people have said, why don't you just do thing over here? Why don't you just do the exact same thing as x86 or PowerPC S390? Why are you inventing the wheel? That sort of thing. And so what I'd like to do today is talk about how and why the F-Trace implementation on ARM64 is the way it is, the problems that we've faced to get to where we are and why we've had to do things a little bit differently. Uh, but first things first, what's F-Trace? I know that several people here work on F-Trace or have implemented F-Trace, so this slide isn't for you. <laughs> uh, but for everyone else, uh, F-Trace is a part of the kernel uh, which is which allows you to attach these things called traces to kernel functions. And traces are just special functions that can gather some information and might be able to manipulate the environment. And as you can see here on the right, um, I've uh, through TraceFS, which is just a magic file system, I've attached a thing called the function graph tracer to every function in the kernel. And I can get out this trace where I can see these functions called each other and how long each function call took. Right? That's really useful. Um, and I've done that dynamically at runtime. I've not had to add any special hooks into each of the functions. I've not had to alter the code. So, it, so you can use it on pretty much anything. Um, I keep on looking. I've got a thing here. <laughs> uh, despite the name, ftrace isn't just about tracing. ftrace is all about hooking functions and attaching these uh, traces. And those traces can do whatever you need for them to be able to do. And so they're used for a few things today. One is fault injection, where we can hook certain functions and like change the way those functions behave, return an error code, and that sort of thing. And for live patching, where you might hook a function uh, and replace it with a newer version of, <laughs> of that function. So you call into a broken function, and before the function does anything, we redirect to a working patched version of the function. Um, and after is used for all these things, and it's used in production. So it's absolutely critical that the use of ftrace doesn't crash the kernel, doesn't break the customer's workload, or they're not going to use it, and they're going to compile it out of the kernel. Similarly, it needs to have minimal overhead. It doesn't necessarily need to be the absolute fastest thing possible, but it needs to have minimal overhead so that it's acceptable and people will use it to debug their workloads. It shouldn't perturb their workloads too much. And achieving all that requires some architecture-specific code. All right. so, in, so if you consider the diagram up here, I've got a function unimaginatively called function. It's called by its caller, or called caller. And normally, function, sorry, caller calls function, function returns back into caller immediately after, and the caller carries on its merry way. But what we want to happen is through some architecture-specific magic, we have the caller call function, and before function does anything, we somehow get to our tracer function, run the tracer, tracer goes back, function does whatever it wants, and goes back to caller. And we want to do that without functional caller knowing anything's happening. And uh, similarly, we're going to need to hook the return so that we can, so on that uh, graph that I showed when we uh, measured how long functions t took, we need to hook the return so we know when they've actually returned. So yeah, this leads to this convoluted looking diagram where caller calls function, function goes into tracer, tracer returns into function, function does it work, function goes into, function returns into the return tracer, the return tracer traces the return, and the return tracer returns back to caller. Um, and OK, that, I think people can understand how that works. But what is this magic? <laughs> how do we do that? And uh, in order to explain that, how do function calls work in the first place? Because <laughs> that varies a lot by architecture. Um, and so here's an assembly dump of three functions on ARM64. We've got, uh, from the left, we have foo, bar, and baz, because I'm bad at naming things. 
uh, and this is what would be generated for like standardish C functions. So on the left here in foo, it's got this uh, two instructions at the top, and then it's got this thing called a BL. Uh, a BL on ARM64 is a function call. It stands for branch and link. Uh, this is similar to a bunch of other architectures like PowerPC and so on. Um, and eventually, its caller, its callee is going to return, and we've got this LDP instruction, this ret, which I'll explain in a minute. <laughs> so when the function is entered, uh, we do this STP, FP, LR, SP, 16, bang, which is a bunch of gobbledygook. But what that means is that is a store pair of the frame pointer and the link register. And the link register is what the branch and link instruction uh, deals with. So rather than pushing the return address to the stack, it stores it in the link register. Um, this is a, a pretty standard thing for risk style architectures, and there are a bunch of trade offs, but this is just what ARM64 does. Uh, the next instruction, that mov f, fp sp, uh, is actually just pointing the fp at the things we just put on the stack. Uh, and, and that will be useful later. Um, and we need to do that because the next thing we're going to do is do the branch and link. And that branch and link is going to clobber the link register that we've... clobber the link register that we just saved the stack. If we don't save the link register at the front, we've lost that and we can never return back to our parent. At the end, after we've done everything we need to do, we have to go and load the old frame pointer link register back, and then when we do a ret, that ret will consume the link register and return back to where we came from. So you can see how foo and bar look pretty much identical. There's, there's a number which is a bit different because they're pushing a different amount of other things to the stack, which I've just uh, removed from this diagram, um, but, the, but they're pretty much the same. You can see baz is a little bit different. Uh, in baz, we're, we're just returning an error code immediately. We're, we're returning e busy and x0, um, but because we're not doing anything, we're not going to call any other functions. We don't need to preserve the link register. We're not going to clobber it, so we don't bother putting anything on the stack, and we just use a ret immediately. Um, so the two functions, foo and bar on the left, are known uh, as non-leaf functions, because they call other functions. And baz is known as a leaf function, because it's the last thing in the call graph you never get. It never goes anywhere else. Does that make sense to everyone? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So, to implement a bit of magic, we're going to rely on uh, we we're going to rely on a piece of GCC functionality called mcount. Um, so GCC uh, and LLVM, in fact, um, have support for this thing called the gprof profiler, and that has some compiler instrumentation that you can enable in the compiler. And what the compiler will do is it will insert this call over here uh, to mcount early on in the function before it does anything interesting. Um, normally, uh, that would, the actual implementation of that mcount function would be provided by gprof and some libraries you have to link. Uh, but since we're the kernel, we can just write our own. Right? And if we have that, that gives us the ability to jump into a tracer early on before we've done any work. Right? So we can build this trampoline that happens to be called mcount, where we <laughs> where caller calls function, function calls mcount, mcount has to manipulate some registers and so on because of calling convention details that aren't important right now. And then eventually it can go and figure out, well, which tracer am I going to run? So here, the way we do that is we just load from a global function pointer and then do an indirect branch, which is what that BLR is. That's branch and link register. That gets us into tracer. Tracer is just a regular C function. It returns back into mcount. mcount undoes everything it did in the first place, returns back into function. Function does its work and then returns back into caller as normal. So. Great. That is the basic way most architectures write ftrace the first time around, because it's a standard GCC feature, and it's a relatively uh, simple thing to do. <sighs> but what the hell do we do about this return? <laughs> well, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, those non-leaf functions save the return address into a thing on the stack. Um, and that, that pair of frame pointer and link register on the stack in um, our calling convention is called a frame record, and it's somewhere within your stack frame. It might be at the bottom, it might be at the top, it might be in the middle, it doesn't really matter, because the frame pointer points to it. So it doesn't really matter where it is. Um, and so you can see here the STP, FPLR, SP-16, that's storing frame pointer link register stack. MOV, FP, SP is just pointing a frame pointer at that. Uh, the MOV is just the MOV next is just uh, for some reason mcount takes the link register as an argument, but I, we don't really need it. And then we go and branch to mcount. 
Um, so when we get into mCount, we have access to the link register of the caller because the frame pointer points to this thing on the snack which contains the link register. Um, and so what we can do is look at that register, go and save that away, and we can go and modify it to point to an entirely different function. And so when we do that, we have this even more convoluted looking diagram where the only new bit at uh, the front here is where I say swap saved LR in mCount. And that's just doing exactly what I said, reading the thing off the stack, putting it aside into a data structure, replacing it with a new function pointer, and then continuing along. And that means that when function gets to its ret, it will go and branch to the frame to, to the link register. That link register we've changed to go to return to handler, which I hate the naming of. <laughs> um, and then in return to handler, we can basically do the same thing that mCount did to go and find the return tracer. We go and load a global variable, we go and indirectly branch to it, and then we can write our return tracer in C. Our return tracer then returns back to return to handler. Return to handler figures out how to get the original LR, and then it can directly branch back all the way into caller. So, in the center. Ah, perfect, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, does that make sense to everyone? Paul. I'll bite. Uh, suppose you take an interrupt inside the tracer function, and then that gets to a function that's also traced. Presumably, you have per so, CPU yeah. variables with um, so context. So, if an interrupt happens, exception handling will save and restore everything that's necessary, and it's transparent for the interrupted context. Is the way that generally works. There are some special rules on whether trace functions can themselves be traced because you don't want this to recurse infinitely. Uh, but that's enforced by the ftrace core code and. It's a little bit more convoluted than I have time for here, and please wait until the end of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, no. I, no, I just want to ask one, one question and see if you could get the answer right. How do you handle tail calls? How do I handle tail calls? Yes. So exactly the same way, because for a tail call, um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> in a tail call, you don't actually do a branch and link into the tail function. You just do a branch, and the link register is just left there. And then when the function that you've called in your tail call returns, it returns the original link register, goes all the way back to the, to the caller of the thing that actually did the tail call. And so in terms of ftrace, there's nothing special there. If the first function is instrumented, it doesn't matter. If the second function is instrumented, it inherits the LR, and that gets traced. Well, so the question here I'm saying is, so the first function you get, you save the LR, right? You second the second uh, trace, you save the LR, but actually the second one never, it, so when it returns back, it skips it. So I know why you is have, it not? I know you have special stack stuff for this, but. It actually works out of pure uh, uh, luck. It, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> Let me get the fundamentals first. <laughs> But anyway, if you understand this, you understand the fundamentals of ftrace, of, of like the, the actual hooking mechanism. So now we're doing that all the time. Um, I mentioned that the compiler has inserted this call to mCount in every function. Um, if we're not actually using tracing, what's going to happen? We're going to still call mCount. We're going to get into mCount. mCount's going to decide, ah, there's no tracer to call, and return back. So, so we, we handle that correctly, but this isn't that great uh, because functions aren't being traced most of the time. Like usage of actual uh, the trace of stuff I showed earlier, that's pretty bursty. That's someone trying to analyze a problem. So they, they might be on a production system. They might need to leave it running for a few minutes or a few hours or whatever, but it's typically not on all the time. And even in the case where we're live patching functions, we're going to live patch like a handful of functions at a time. We're not going to be patching everything. So we don't really want to pay the, the expense of doing the call to mCount every time we call into a function. Because as, as it says, if, we, if everything always calls mCount, it's buy one function call, get one free. And, the co and we're just paying more costs than we need to. But it, since our function call is just this single instruction BL, 
um, this is pretty easy to patch dynamically. Uh, and due to the way our procedure call standard works, it's actually safe to patch that to a NOP uh, because the mcount function is just returning void. There's nothing to consume the return value. There are no, while well, there's an argument to it, it doesn't matter for the subsequent things. Um, so we can just patch this to a NOP. Uh, sorry, so, so when we want to enable the thing, we can patch this to mcount. And when we want to disable tracing, we can just patch this to a NOP. And if we do that, we're basically not paying overhead of the function call at all when we're not using tracing. We have to have the, the few instructions to shuffle things around in the function all the time. But we're avoiding the bulk of the overhead of going into the tracer just to immediately return. Um, and if we've built the infrastructure for doing that, we can even patch the call to the tracer in the trampoline, in the uh, mcount function itself. Rather than loading up a global variable, we can just patch that to go directly to the tracer, which is, which is neat. So, so once we've got all of that, this is a pretty standard ftrace implementation. Lots of architectures get to this level and and move on or have variations on this, I know. <laughs> but, but fundamentally, it, we have three things here that are interesting. We've got a mechanism to hook function entry. We use compiler implementation to do it so we haven't had to go and modify the source code. We've had to write a special trampoline, but that's one trampoline that's relatively simple. We've got a mechanism to hook function returns, and we haven't had to do anything special with the, fun with the actual function on the return path, we got that effectively for free by tracking, by hooking the entry. We get the ability to just hook the return. Um, and we have to write a trampoline for that. And we've got a mechanism to enable and disable it. But that, that's like the fundamental aspects to get a production quality ftrace implementation in the architecture code, ignoring all the bits that have to work in the core code, which is multiple presentations in its own right. And Stephen will be able to direct you to many. <laughs> Um, so that's all in good. Uh, and we had that for a few years. But in 2017, um, ARM added this new feature to the ARM architecture called pointer authentication. Uh, and it's designed to protect against return oriented programming and uh, jump oriented programming attacks where people corrupt pointers. Um, and it works by way of these two new instructions. Uh, there's this thing called PAC IASP and AUT IASP, um, which stands for PAC Instruction A Key SP and ought instruction A key SP, which is equally as useless to your understanding as the names that are on there. <laughs> but the interesting thing is this pack ASP instruction, it will take the LR, it will take the stack pointer, and it takes a, a magic key that's in another system register, it doesn't matter. And it, does it, and it creates a message authentication code and puts it into the LR, into some bits that are, just happen to not be used. And that gets called a pointer authentication code. And on the way back, this auto ASP instruction does effectively the same thing, but it checks if it's got the code correct. And if that code is not correct because you've modified the pointer or, or the stack pointer is not the same or uh, the key, <laughs> or that secret key has been changed, it's fatal. Um, depending on the particular core you're on, that might result in a later um, um, instruction abort, which is a fault on an instruction fetch, or it might immediately trap. So that's all in good. Um, so the entire point of this feature is to, preve to prevent anyone from modifying the saved LR, uh, which is exactly what we're doing in mcount. <laughs> uh, and worse, like I mentioned earlier how these stack frames might be different sizes, right? So it could be 16 bytes, it could be 96 bytes, it could be 1,000 bytes, who knows? When we get into mcount, we have no idea what that offset is, so we can't even counteract it. We can't build a special thing where we uh, temporarily put a different SP or use a, one of a different instruction list. We have absolutely no idea. Uh, so how are we going to make return tracing work with this? Well, GCC 8 plus added, sorry, um, in GCC 8 on onwards, uh, there's this new feature called dash f patchable function entry equals n. Um, as it says here, it allows you to insert a number of knobs early on in the function, and those that happen to be before we get to the pack ASP. Uh, and the idea of this um, of this feature, as the name implies, it's for patchable function. It's for a, put whatever you want at the start of a function. It's up to you, but the compiler just puts knobs there to reserve some space for you. Now, because we do that, so we can use that in the kernel, uh, and we can patch in a branch to um, 
our trampoline, uh, which has been renamed at this point from M count to F trace cooler because we're not using M count anymore, and it's a name. Um, <laughs> but now the compiler isn't saving the LR for us, so we have to do that ourselves. And rather than putting that on the stack, what we're going to do is we're going to put it in a register because our calling convention uh, for function calls, uh, x0 to x8, the first nine registers are used for function arguments. Some of the higher registers from x16 onwards we can't use for various reasons, but we've got a bunch of registers in the middle that we can just use. So rather than paying the cost of putting something onto the stack, uh, we're just going to patch in this mov, and we're going to leave it there at all times. And, and to enable, when we enable and disable the tracer, we're just going to patch the branch, because a mov is incredibly cheap. And it's not worth the hassle of trying to patch multiple things and dealing with all of the race conditions that you get here. Um, and once we've got that, it's pretty simple. We've saved the LR into register. We've got a call into the trampoline. The trampoline can go and get at the saved LR because it knows it's an X9. So it can do exactly what it did before. Uh, and the only other thing is it has to save registers to the stack because the compiler isn't saving the, all the argument registers for us. And if we're about to call another function, which is going to clobber those registers, we need to make sure they're saved somewhere. Um, and the end result of this is something that looks remarkably similar to what we had before. The few instructions in function are a little bit different. We've got a little bit of extra work we do early on in ftrace caller, but it's the stuff that would have been in every function beforehand. So actually, it's a net win. We're, safe, we're, we're not duplicating all that logic in every function. And we have to go and restore it on the way out. But that's about it. Um, uh, to change the return address, we have to go and modify the, the, the LR directly rather than the value on the stack, but that's easy enough. And return to handler is identical. It doesn't need to be changed at all because it's exactly the same from its point of view. Right. Uh, and you can see it makes a pretty big difference. So if we've got a function over here which does uh, get CPU ops, takes an a int CPU, and it loads from a per CPU pointer, it does a tiny bit of work and loads of things. When we compile with mcount, it has to generate all of this work to push, to, to save the link registers to the stack, save the function call arguments, go and call into mcount, and undo it on the way out. And when we're using patch more function entries, we just get two knots. So you can see this is actually a, a quite dramatic um, code saving for certain functions. Uh, this happens to look really, this is like the most extreme case that I could find and construct myself, and this is because this was a leaf function. For non leaf functions, it's only actually two or three instructions on average that get inserted. Uh, right, so we've done that. Now we've got this neat feature that works with point authentication, and we go on for a few years. Years with that, and that works well. But these days, it's increasingly likely that people want to attach different traces to different functions, but they might even want to attach multiple traces to multiple functions. So, for example, I've mentioned earlier, you might have live patches applied to a handful of functions. BPF might be hooking. Um, uh, a handful of functions. That, that might be because it's tracing those functions, or it might be because it's overriding those functions for various reasons. And in addition to that, someone might want to use the ftrace graph tracer on every function in the kernel, including those ones that have other traces. But from what I showed you before, our ftrace caller trampoline can only call a single tracer. It's either loading a pointer and then branching to that, or it's being patched to go directly to that. And it would be quite painful to go and change the assembly in, the, in every architecture to handle this case by trying each tracer in turn or, or that sort of thing. So in the ftrace core code, there's a special function that can be used as a tracer. And when you call into that, it will go and look over every tracer that exists or, or is active. And it will say, hi, does this tracer apply to this function? No. OK, try the next one. Does this tracer apply to this function? Yes, go and call that tracer. Does this okay, move on to the next tracer and so on? And that ends up being quite expensive, uh, because we've turned one function call into tens, <laughs> right? And, and that's actually a, a serious concern for a variety of use cases, especially things like live patching and, um, sorry, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, a, it's a problem for a variety of use cases, because your performance is going to scale with the number of traces that are registered. And so over time, your performance is going to go down. And even if one function only needs one of those traces, it's paying the cost of all of, of looking at all of them. Um, so a number of architectures have solutions to this. The most common one is that they will jet trampolines at runtime. So rather than having just this ftrace caller trampoline, they'll say, aha, 
my tracer over here, tracer foo, I'm just going to generate a trampoline for that, and I'm going to patch in a call to that from my function directly, and then we can go and call that tracer without any overhead, and you can patch different trampolines into different function call sites. But for a variety of reasons, we can't do this on ARM64. We, we sort of can, but not in a way that's cheap enough or easy enough to maintain or robust enough to be worthwhile. And there are a few things to consider. So one thing that kernels and modules are big, like a def config today is somewhere between 40 and 60 megabytes. I regularly build debug kernels that are 200 or 300 megabytes because a lot of features like KA SAN, UB SAN and so on add, add a lot of instructions, make the kernel much bigger. And the last time I tried an all yes config kernel, it was actually over a gigabyte, uh, but it wouldn't boot. 900 megabytes was the one that I managed to get to boot. Uh, uh, and we recently, honestly, well, we had to expand our module VA space because apparently people are loading modules which are bigger than 128 meg. Uh, and, we, and we have about two gigabytes of VA space. Um, as I mentioned, we're a risk architecture. Our branch instructions are fixed width. All instructions are 32 bits. Uh, that means we only have a subset of those bits used for the offset of a branch. And so our branch instructions can only actually go up or down 128 megabytes. Um, so if we're in one of those crazy modules, we can't even get out of the module in the first place. <laughs> um, we have a general solution to this, which are, which are called PLTs or veneers, where you basically put a tiny code segment very close to the code which is branching. That it can do is a direct branch to there, and then, the, and then that PLT can use a much more elaborate sequence to do an indirect branch anywhere else. But you need to place those close to their caller. And if you want to load a tracer in a module, and then you want kernel functions to branch to that, you, you can't guarantee that they are close enough. We might, the kernel or the module themselves might just be too big to start with. And no matter what we do, we can't make that work. Uh, and you think, OK, so we need to do something and use an indirect branch. Uh, but it's very painful to patch in the elaborate sequences that you need to use to do to use a, an indirect branch into every function that we're instrumenting. So ARM has a thing called CMODEX, which stands for Concurrent Modification and Execution of Instructions Rules. And it basically says, if you patch most instructions to another instruction, you've done the wrong thing. And a variety of things uh, that are called constrained unpredictable, which is a bit like undefined behavior, can occur. Um, and we only, and the architecture only allows you to patch things like NOPs, direct branches, certain exception generating instructions to others. So we don't really want to patch, we, we can't patch in like load address into a register instructions. Uh, and even if we did, if we got to patch multiple instructions in a row, we can't guarantee that any thread is not going to be in the middle of one of those sequences as we're patching it. So, so it, it's, just, it's just not really feasible. Um, it's expensive. We'd have to stop the world. Um, and it's just very painful. It's just not going to be robust. So we don't want to do that. So what are we going to do? Well, I lied a little bit earlier about dash f patchable function entry. It actually takes two arguments. So it takes this first one, n, uh, and it takes the second one, m. Um, that m is the number of knobs to put before the function entry point. And, I, and for some reason, <laughs> The number of not to put after the function entry point is m minus n rather than them just being separate numbers. I don't know why. It's just the way it got designed. But what we can do is we can use it. We can place some nops before the function. And there are a variety of things you might think we could do. Like, oh, you could put all the elaborate sequence in there and branch back to it and so on. But it basically suffers from all the problems I said before. So it doesn't really save us anything. But we can cheat and use this for something that isn't instructions. So what we can do is reserve two knobs, which happens to be eight bytes because instructions are 32 bit. We can align functions to eight bytes. And actually, uh, people have been arguing that we should align functions to 16 bytes or more for performance reasons. And there's a big back and forth. But it turns out that this doesn't have much of a size impact. So we could do that. And if we do that, that gives us space to put a pointer before each function. It's eight byte aligned. It's eight byte in size. We can write to that atomically with things like write once. And when we get into the trampoline, 
because we've got the link register, and the link register will point just after the function call, and because we know how many instructions we have between that, we can just subtract off a number and get the address of this pointer, load it, and use it for something. That's exactly what we do. So this quad here, that just means a 64-bit value in uh, GNU assembly. We put the pointer to the tracer in there. We leave the function instrumentation exactly as it was. And in our uh, trampoline, we just have this load x2 from x10, because we happen to have saved the LR in x10, minus 16 to subtract off of the four instructions. Um, and now we've got our pointer. And now we can just do an indirect branch to it, exactly as before. Now we can get into our tracer, and all of the rest of it is exactly the same as before, um, which is great. It means that we've made, uh, and with that, we can give each individual function its own tracer, or if it needs to call multiple tracers, we can make it use that thing which iterates over a number of them. And then it's only the rare case that's paying the cost, which is great. It means that we've made per call site tracers possible and cheaper. Um, it means we've avoided a bunch of arbitrary limitations. So I, so I mentioned before about how these things could be, how uh, the kernel modules could be arbitrarily large and so on. And we've only got a fixed amount of VA space where we can actually put executable memory because of other uh, range limitations. Um, and if we were using trampolines, we'd have to place, place those in the right, place those within those boundaries. And if we can't, we just have to fail to register a tracer. Whereas because we can put an arbitrary 64-bit pointer in here, we can place tracers anywhere in memory and we know that we can always get to them. And we don't need to allocate trampolines, jet that code, do a bunch of maintenance for that. It's great. Um, and it makes, uh, I showed you, like the logic in the trampoline is incredibly simple. It's one, ex it's, well, it's two extra instructions. <laughs> but, it, but it's really simple to reason about. We're just loading a pointer and branching to it. And when we're actually enabling things, it's pretty much the same as before. We, we patch the knock to a branch in the call site. And we also have to patch a pointer, but we can make sure that that pointer is always valid. So we can have, we actually default that to pointing at a tracer which does nothing. And so while there is a race where the two might be out of sync, that race happens to be benign. We enable a tracer and you go to the not tracer, doesn't matter. If we've updated the pointer and you haven't seen the branch yet, well, you don't call the tracer yet. It's exactly the same as what would happen if we weren't using this. Um, and it's just very simple. I'm very happy with it. <laughs> it's really easy to reason about. We can be pretty sure that this isn't going to blow up in our face. Um, and with this facility to have a pointer per call site, that means we can do a bunch of other things, because we don't just have to use a pointer to the tracer there. We can put any other information we want. So for direct calls, we can just extend that to have multiple pointers. We can have a pointer to the tracer, and we can have a pointer to the direct call function. And we can get that. Um, and because I am not very good at writing presentations, <laughs> I, am, I have no idea if I am at half my time, 40% of my time, whatever. So I uh, haven't really had the chance to talk about um, that last thing I said about direct calls. But fine, that's, that's been implemented in the meantime, and it's just a very s small variation of what I've just described. <laughs> uh, and there's a few other things that I've missed talking about. Um, like I mentioned how some things were very cheap and some things are very expensive. Um, one of the things I did on the process of working on this, I've written a, the ftrace ops module, and that allows you to register ftrace ops dynamically, which are traces, and play around with a bunch of parameters to see it, how expensive certain things are. Uh, we also replaced ftrace with regs with ftrace with args on ARM64, because as I mentioned earlier, we're only using a subset of the registers for arguments. Why should we save all of them? Um, and a lot of this work was done by other people. So obviously, Steve Rostert, Masami Hiramatsu, the FTrace maintainers. Akashi Takahiro did the original FTrace uh, work on ARM64. So that was all that magic v1 portion. Uh, Torsten Duvet, Suve, Suze, both wrote the patchable function entry support in GCC and the original Linux support. Uh, Fangari Song uh, at Google wrote support for patchable function entry in LLVM, so we can just use the same mechanism everywhere. Juk, juk, uh. Zhu uh, made some early attempts at making uh, these trampolines and direct calls sort of things work on ARM64 uh, and helped to review and test uh, what eventually got in. And recently, uh, Florian Rovest has done ARM64 direct calls. And that's it for me. <laughs>
a long time ago, I used, I don't remember exactly the option name, I think it was uh, uh, dash F instrument functions and something like this on GCC. It would place a call to something prologue at the beginning and something epilogue at the, uh, yeah. the ending. I don't know if it's supported on all architectures, but since you had to hack in the stack or with the LR, etc., mm. I'm wondering why uh, you did not, not use something like this if it exists at so all. So there's, there's a few reasons. So uh, I'm, I'm not certain whether F instrument functions are supported on all architectures, but as you say, it, it adds instrumentation at both the entry point and the return, yeah. right? If we want to do a graph trace, we want to see, like, we enter the function and then we returned. We want those to be paired. We want to have, catch the entry and the return, right? Um, if we have separate instrumentation points in the function for the call and the return, and we're enabling that while, while the function is being concurrently executed, one of the CPUs might be part way through that function, might have gone past the entry point instrumentation, and then later call the exit point instrumentation, the return side of the instrumentation, and then we have to add a bunch of logic to handle that, which I'm sure Steve is going to say we already do. <laughs> but also, yeah. but also it adds a bunch yeah. of extra instructions that we can avoid. Yeah. So the instrumentation functions, that's like the first thing we looked at when we actually, back in 2008, when we were writing all this. And do you, have you looked at the disassembly of that? It's like four or five call like functions on both this entry and exit. And trying to no-op that out, we played with a lot of things, and it was just... It was just a nightmare to implement. So yeah, it was a mess. That, that was my question. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was exactly my question. Was that why, in fact, I, I suspected there there were some drawbacks, but I could not figure why. Uh, which ones? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have only looked at that at a very superficial level, but it's basically stuff like. Yeah. Okay. Um, would this patchable function entry also work on ARM32? It could be implemented on ARM32 as well, yes. Um, at the moment, um, ARM32 is, is still using a variation of mCount. It has a slightly different ABI where um, it does actually push the return address to the stack, and the instruction which gets patched is either a call or a pop, effectively, um, which technically speaking violates the CMODX rules. <laughs> But, but yeah, it, it absolutely could be implemented for ARM, um, and it can be implemented for a, a variety of architectures. The, the GCC and LVM feature is generic across architectures by design. And then I have another question. So um, in the ARM64 implementation you showed in the latest slide, you do a branch and link to the F-trace caller. Um, so can it happen that this is more than 120 megabytes away? So yes. Um, so, there is a latent issue here which we need to solve for within the kernel image when the kernel image gets large. But for modules, uh, I mentioned before you can have those, those PLTs or veneers. We can make sure that those are present when we generate the module, and then in the module we know that's in range, and then we can have a PLT branch all the way to the F-trace caller trampoline. Uh, it's uh, a little bit related, but are you aware, or many, someone else, of uh, something available for, to patch user land? Because I'm often missing the ability to easily patch user land. I know that in kernel it's easy, but mm. uh, in user land starting to play with uh, permissions, etc., is complicated, and I'm not aware of uh, a portable solution. So I'm not aware of something that's like similar enough to it. Like, the GCC feature obviously exists, but you'd have to build your own infrastructure for patching stuff. There are lots of use land things for dynamically patching code, things like Dynamo, Rio, and so on. But they're all catered towards different use cases, normally architectural exploration stuff. So I, I, I don't really have much experience with them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, how long have we had uh, patchable function entries on ARM64? Um, so that was since. It was either late 2017 or early 2018 that support for it was added in the kernel. It was added in GCC 8, and I cannot remember which version of LLVM it was added in, but it's the, it's, it, it was added before we upped the minimum supported version of LLVM, so it's in every version of LLVM that we support. <laughs> 
Okay, so my details are a bit fuzzy, but at the end of 2019, we had a customer project where we had to disable F-Trace on ARM64 because we uh, lost a lot of throughput in network code. We thought it was because of uh, iCache pressure. Do you, are you aware of such problems? That so I'm aware of such problems with mCount. I'm aware that obviously we're inserting um, more, obviously, the side on the right has got more instructions than the, than the side on the far left, so there's obviously going to be some pressure there. I wouldn't expect the series of NOPs to have that much of an impact. Um, and actually, in terms of code size, uh, sorry, in just terms of cache pressure, in terms of code size, uh, uh, I, I gathered some data and um, so like a default kernel image, which was about 38-ish meg at the time, uh, using mCount uh, made it pretty big. Using patchable function entry without call ops was better. Using patchable function entry with call ops is just marginally better than mCount on average. Um, I don't have data on full production workloads, but it, it might be worth taking a look in because if you're using a compiler earlier than GCC 8, that, that would not be using the feature. And if you weren't using dynamic ftrace, uh, it would it wouldn't even be patching the function call. Okay, we'll have to revisit what we did back then. Thank you. Cool, I'm gonna shoot them any more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.